legs evolved, I happen to think, were an evolutionary aberrant. But most mutations are deleterious and induce disease. As we know, we all carry several hundred genes for disease, cystic fibrosis, diabetes, phenylketonuria, inborn errors of metabolism, dwarfism. There are now 2,600 genetic diseases described. Most are recessive. And yet George Monbiot, in his wisdom, accrued over three days reading some scientific and medical literature, said that surprisingly no genetic abnormalities were seen in the offspring of the Hibakusha at Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Why not? Because either they were uh, fatal mutations, there were many spontaneous abortions, um, many children have been born with gross congenital abnormalities which are almost certainly teratogenic and this is described in this wonderful book put together, together by Yablikov and I can't wait to hear him speak later on and Nesterenko, two Nesterenkos photographs of children with phocomelia babies bo were born with anencephaly, cyclops, um, spina bifida, you name it there are homes full of children in Belarus and Ukraine of grossly deformed children. But most mutations are recessive, and it takes up to 20 generations for two recessive genes, i.e. cystic fibrosis, to get together to form a child with that particular disease. George Monbiot and his colleagues know nothing about genetics. Why? Because we have not taught them. The physicists all this time have prevailed since the 1940s in the Manhattan Project. When the physicists from Los Alamos and Lawrence Livermore go to Congress, they almost have a Merlin's cap. They're magic. They walk into Congress, a red carpet's laid out in front of them, and the Congress people virtually lie down in front of them metaphorically because they've harnessed the energy inside the center of the sun, E equals mc squared, the most enormous energy. What did Einstein say? The splitting, and this is the most profound statement I probably could make today, the splitting of the atom changed everything all reality, save man's mode of thinking. Thus we drift towards unparalleled catastrophe. They think of nuclear bombs like they thought of swords and jousting and pistols. They still think like that. The Pentagon talks like that. It's not the Department of Defense, it's the Department of Death. America is spending almost $1 trillion a year on death, and it doesn't have even a free medical care system because that's socialist or even communist. We are in a very terrible situation. And peaceful nuclear energy arose from these scientists' brains, capturing the heat of splitting the atom to boil water. As Einstein said, Nuclear power is a hell of a way to boil water. And that's all nuclear power does. But in each reactor is as much... Ra the, the uranium becomes one billion times more radioactive when fissioned in the reactor, one billion times. 200 new isotopes are made, some with half-lives of seconds, some with billions of years. And the nuclear industry talk about external radiation, background radiation, it used to be 170 millirems a year. Suddenly it's become okay to say it's 350 millirems a year. I said to my colleague Arjun Makajani, how did it suddenly rise and double? He said, oh, they're adding radon to background radiation. Some people live in houses with radon, most do not. No background radiation is safe. It adds already to the numbers of cancers we see now, maybe 30% or more. The Bear Report of the National Academy of Sciences, number seven, said that no radiation is safe, it's cumulative. Yet, everyone gets a dental x-ray once a year. Alice Stewart, 
she discovered that one X ray to the pregnant abdomen to the fetus doubles the incidence of leukemia in that child's lifetime. She was shunned by the nuclear industry for years and made fun of. Her data now stands and is accepted with scientific validity. We, um, we do not learn in medical school what internal, internal emitters are. I did not learn what gamma radiation was, but I learned later that it is produced by radioactive isotopes, cesium, strontium, uh, cobalt-60, and we use it in the treatment of cancer. People are confused. Why do we use radiation to treat cancer? We don't explain that radiation kills actively dividing cells. That's why the fetus is thousands of times more radiosensitive than adults, why babies and children are 10 to 20 times more radiosensitive. We've got X-ray machines at airports to walk through. They're radiating fetuses. They're radiating babies. They're irradiating immunocompromised people. This is wicked. And what do we do? Nothing. What did I learn? I was not taught in medical school what an alpha emitter was. I was not taught it was a particulate composed of two protons and two neutrons, which travels not very far. It doesn't penetrate dead la layers of epidermis to damage living dermal cells, but it's grossly mutagenic. And it produces high levels of radiation to a very small volume of cells in the lung. Tiny volume. And as radiation decreases with the square of the distance, most cells die, but on the periphery of that volume, cells remain viable and mutate and develop cancer. People do not understand the latent period of carcinogenesis. They think that if you get irradiated, you'll drop dead. Sure, if you get 250 to 500 rems, LD50, half the people will die of acute radiation illness as the liquidators died and the liquidators at Fukushima are now dying. But to get cancer takes, as we know from Hiroshima and Nagasaki, leukemia five to 10 years, solid cancers 15 to 60 years. Do we explain that to the public? Do we tell them that no cancer wears an identifying badge saying it was made by some strontium-90 you ate in a piece of chocolate, Hershey's chocolate, 20 years ago as Three Mile Island is 15 miles from Hershey's chocolates? and had a major meltdown, and many people were impacted. I didn't learn about, oh, I want to just finish, plutonium, iron analogue, combines with transferrin, transferred to the um, mediastinal lymph glands, where it can cause lymphoma, stored in the liver, where it causes liver cancer, goes to the bone marrow for haemoglobin, causes osteogenic sarcoma or leukaemia, crosses the placenta, which lets nothing pass except iron, where, like thalidomide, it's teratogenic. It has a predilection for testicles and deposits just next to the spermatogonia, the precursors of the sperm, where it induces mutations that will be passed on generation to generation, while if the man is cremated, his smoke goes out the chimney to get into another man's testicles. And so we can see an exponential increase in genetic disease and deformities for the rest of time called random compulsory genetic engineering. How dare they? And we're not the only species with genes. 30 million other species cohabit the planet with us, all of which have genes, all of which develop congenital deformities and genetic disease and malignancies. I didn't learn about beta radiation, which is given off by radioactive iodine-131. I didn't learn about beta radiation given off by cesium-137. I didn't know what cesium was. It's a potassium analog, ubiquitous in the body, induces brain cancers, rhabdomyosarcomas, rare as hen's teeth. Um, I didn't learn about cobalt-60, which is not a fission product, but an activation product. I wrote about all of this in this book recently, Nuclear Power is Not the Answer. People don't understand that internal emitters induce very high doses of radiation. It's not 
low-dose radiation, it's high-dose, high-dose. And yet we don't teach them this. And without understanding, we have an uninformed population. An informed democracy will behave in a responsible fashion, and that's what we did in the 80s. We informed people about the medical implications of nuclear war. Most Americans in 78 said to me, oh, it's better to be dead than red. I said, really? They said, yeah, we don't want to be communist. So we started doing the bombing run and dropping bombs on Boston and describing the medical implications. Vaporization up to five miles, lethal burns up to 20 miles, and they'd wake up in the morning and look at the Boston Globe and say, oh, nuclear war is bad for our health. In five years, we educated 80% of Americans to be opposed to the concept of nuclear war. Petra and all of you educated Germany and Europe. The whole world rose up and helped to lead to the end of the Cold War. However, the weapons were not removed. We are living with death machines. Death, which is silent, cryptogenic, latent, takes a long time to develop. Only we, the medical profession, understand cancer. And yet we're not teaching the ordinary people nor the scientifically illiterate politicians what this means, the latent period of carcinogenesis, the toxicity of these fission products. Angela Merkel... Yeah, she's a physicist. Good. She understands the danger of Fukushima. Good. But does she understand the bio radiobiology? And unless people understand this, we are doomed. That was an excerpt from a speech I gave in Berlin in April 2011 at the International Physicians for the Prevention of Nuclear War Congress on the 25th anniversary of Chernobyl. Thanks for listening today. Look, I know it was a fairly emotional <laughs> interview on my part. I can't help it. I'm a physician, a paediatrician. How many children have I helped to die with cystic fibrosis, the most common lethal genetic disease of childhood, which will be increased in frequency down the time track by nuclear power and, and over 2,000 other such diseases. How many children have I helped die, to die of leukemia or cancer? It's the most heart-rending experience you could possibly imagine. I'm sorry, I can't help being emotional. And I think, indeed, if we're not emotional about these things, there's something wrong with us. And I, I often use this analogy. If I have two parents in my office and I tell them that their child has just been diagnosed with leukemia, and they show no emotional response. I get them a psychiatrist because they need help with their grief. Thanks for listening today. We'll be with, with you next week. You've been listening to If You Love This Planet with Dr. Helen Caldicott. This program is broadcast on community radio across the United States, including our host station, KPFT Pacifica, Houston, Texas. This program is produced and engineered by Jazz Williams, co-produced by Scott Powell, and our publicity and outreach are coordinated by Amanda Bellerby. To listen to previous shows or to make a donation, go to our website, ifyoulovethisplanet.org.